5,000 years ago, the gathering of followers by leaders had led to this in Egypt, the pyramid tomb of a leader and of fields like those worked by his followers. The fields may have been laid out differently, but they were as fertile then as we see them now, or no such tomb would have been built. The water we see in the little canal comes not from rain. If it did, the desert would not appear so abruptly. Rain hardly ever falls here. The water came into this little canal from a river longer than the continental United States is wide. It is a river that flows through a thousand miles of the Sahara Desert, the desert on which this tomb stands. This river is the Nile, co-creator of the narrow strip of green land that is Egypt. Its waters pour from a great lake on the equator. Arriving in the Sudan, it is sharply augmented by water from heavy June rains that have fallen on the distant mountains of Ethiopia. This water collects in overflowing lakes and in rivers, and is carried by the Blue Nile here at the bottom, joining the more sluggish waters of the White Nile coming up from East Central Africa. Now strengthened, the combined Nile River then continues its long journey north to Egypt. This photograph from space shows its beginning in the blue lakes at the bottom of the screen, its flow through green and rainy lands, then its long desert passage north to create the thin green thread with a triangle of delta at the end that is Egypt. Every July, swollen with Ethiopia's runoff, the Nile brings into the valley that it has carved out for Egypt more water than its banks can then contain. Water begins to spread over the valley floor towards the desert hills on either side. It soaks the ground, fills the wells and catchment basins that people have dug and maintained for thousands of years. It fills the canals which carry the water still further than the flood would reach and which men have toiled over since the first canal was dug. When in late September the flood waters recede, the soil is covered with a layer of natural fertilizer provided by the African continent. No other African kingdom was as fortunate. Even when the river had sunk back into its channel, water was still available, though now more effort was required. Small wonder that the Egyptians were often able to raise two, sometimes three crops in a year. The ancient Egyptians knew nothing about climatology and pressure zones, nor that the Nile issued from blue lakes in unknown green lands. Had they known, would this have altered their belief, surrounded as they were by vast, dry emptiness, that the river's water was a gift to them, a gift from Hapi, god of the Nile? He with a ruler's beard, for is he not ruler of lives? Male with a woman's breasts, like a woman he brings forth increase. He wears the lotus crown, the flower most beloved by the valley dwellers. He faces his twinned likeness, though a likeness wearing a papyrus crown, like the papyrus of the delta. His twin stands among the growing plants. Upper and lower Egypt, the two lands, Hapi, twinned single god of the river, 
binds the two kingdoms together. He is the Nile's flow. He is Egypt. There are things that cannot be answered. Why in some years the flow is low with not enough water to grow around? Seedlings wither, people hunger, people starve. Why in some other years the flow is so heavy that lifetimes of effort are swept away and lives? The God alone knows why. An Egyptian wrote on papyrus of times when the cattle are driven mad and all the world, both great and small, are in torment. But when righteousness and order prevailed and prayers were heard and neither too little nor too much water was sent into Egypt, then the same man wrote, the earth shouts with joy, then are all bellies joyful each back is shaken with laughter, and every tooth grindeth. Years later, when Egypt had become a Roman province, a Roman writer wrote this on the fluctuations in flood level and their effect on the mood of the country. An average rise is one of seven meters. A smaller volume of water does not irrigate all the localities, and a larger one, by retiring too slowly, retards agriculture, and the latter uses up the time for sowing because of the moisture of the soil, while the former gives no time for sowing because the soil is parched. Egypt takes note of both extremes. In a rise of five and a half meters, it senses famine and even in one of six meters it begins to feel hungry. But six and a half meters brings cheerfulness. Six and three quarters complete confidence and seven meters delight. But the river was not alone in shaping the life of Egypt. It had a partner, the desert. The desert kept Egypt free of foreign occupation for centuries. But exactly how its defining grip shaped the civilization remains an open question. The desert had not always existed. Like everything, it came into being. Where the spacecraft's camera is pointing was once a green land. Swamp rats lived down there, crocodile and giraffe. People had houses there, they had cattle. They visited friends. And relaxed, they left many paintings on the rocks. But climate change occurred. Rains failed, pastures dried, places where people had grown up were abandoned. Some refugees from the spreading disaster found a river valley in the desert. The valley floor was a swamp that had to be drained. The tangle of vegetation had to be uprooted. And burned. The work was probably heavier than these people had ever performed in their lives, but it was their last resort. As North Africa's rainfall diminished and ceased and the region became a furnace by day, the narrow strip of valley and the broader delta reached by the river's irrigating and fertilizing waters began to fill up with farmers and their descendants. The future was hidden from them. They didn't know that their efforts would result in the emergence of civilization, and that with civilization, most of their descendants would lose ownership of the land they tilled, the crops they grew, the animals they tended, 
nor could they have known that some of their descendants would be rounded up to fight others who had not injured them, like these army recruits, pioneers of an experience to be repeated endlessly throughout the future, the experience of being instructed in the ways of the military, as in the top register of this scene, of having their hair cut like the two at the bottom, after waiting their turn or biding their time, or, like those souls sitting under the sycamore, perhaps bored out of their minds. And then, being led into harm's way in wars not of their choosing. None of the early settlers could have imagined the birth of an Egyptian proverb that went, Man has a back, and only obeys when it is beaten. In this case, the beating was for tax evasion, and the culprit was afterwards thrown into a ditch. Authorized beating of men by henchmen with sticks would become so common that even a man prosperous enough to afford a tomb and to have his accomplishments inscribed inside would include among them that he had never been beaten. That men would be bound and taken into captivity, sometimes to far-off places, was not anticipated. Nor was being dragged from one's family into slavery. As all living things are blind to the future, also unforeseen was that civilization would bring some descendants of these early settlers work that wouldn't have been considered work by those who worked with their backs. There would be scribes whose lives would revolve around a new skill, writing. Writing would enable people to communicate to their descendants, including those not yet born, even after their own voices had been silenced by death. It would help to prevent disputes about agreements, like this sharecropper contract on papyrus. It is signed by a notary and two witnesses. It details the sharecropper's obligation to the temple owner of the field being rented. It would enable orders to be transmitted when one was not present to transmit them, like this order for windows, painted on a piece of pottery. Nactamon, you will make four like this. The purchaser adds a sketch showing he wants barred windows, exactly like this, and very, very quickly, by tomorrow. Width, four palms, height, five palms, and two fingers. The script is a shorthand developed by scribes from hieroglyphics, which was reserved for writing of a sacred and official character. Who would have thought that the appearance of humans could be made to survive their death, as has that of this official? Or that the name and face of the priest, Ka'apa, would remain visible for thousands of years? The first settlers along the Nile were people of the Stone Hole. They governed themselves. They didn't imagine that strangers would come among their descendants giving orders. Those giving orders would also be their descendants, unrecognized as distant kin by those receiving orders. The early settlers along the Nile could not have foreseen that the flat-topped little hills that represented the shape of their society and all human societies for more than a million years prior would begin to be replaced everywhere by the pyramid. Least of all that one person would have the power to compel obedience from more than a million others, what was required of them, what was permitted, what forbidden. This had never happened in human experience. Hidden from the first farmers of the stone hole was that this person would not acknowledge descent from them, but would claim descent from the gods and have himself proclaimed God incarnate. His dual nature as living God and heavenly spirit speaks from this reproduction of a message in paint left on the tomb of Ramses II. In his earthly form, 
Ramses brings a gift of roped Ethiopian and Nubian prisoners to other gods and goddesses. On the right, closest to Ramses, is Amun, ruler of the universe. Last in the group is Mut, Amun's consort. Between them is the divine form of Ramses II himself, as the sun god. The road ahead from those who began clearing the banks of the Nile to the command of a million by a god incarnate was a long one, about 3,000 years long. Bits and pieces remain, like these vases. No longer were all being buried in the sand with the simplest of possessions. Some were being placed in tombs along with things they admired and possessed. The vase maker drilled and shaped them from blocks of hard black basalt. They speak of exertion, patience, training, and the skill to execute an idea. We don't know how the process started of small self-governing agricultural communities merging into ever larger communities, each under a single ruler. Perhaps grain was distributed during a famine from those with to those without, and a leader emerged. Perhaps he was a benefactor, perhaps a war leader, probably both. Centralized, fully stocked granaries and water distribution would remain key on the way to a unified Egypt as well as after unification. By about 5,000 years ago, the number of rulers downstream of the first cataract on the Nile had been reduced to two. Under them were then two peoples and two lands, a valley kingdom and a delta kingdom. No record exists of the issues between the two lands, only of how they were settled. Pictured on the right are enemies decapitated with their arms bound. On the left, a king wearing a crown, the crown of the Delta country. His name is written in front of his head. It is read by Egyptologists from the fish and chisel signs as Nama, Nama towers over all others in the scene, including the dead. There are also numerals and signs denoting 120,000 men, 400,000 cattle, and 1,422,000 goats. If spoils of war, what was the fate of the men enumerated? On the other side of this pallet, Nama's name, the fish and chisel, again appears above. But here he is wearing the crown of the valley. He is king of two lands, it seems, lands with different histories. Two lands of formerly warring kings, now united under a single head. From the sea, traveling up the Nile to the first set of rapids, is a distance of nearly 700 miles. It was the most extensive area and the most people that had ever been brought together on the planet. It had been accomplished with bloodshed, but it conveyed the prospect to people of never again being attacked by groups of strangers a promise of peace, eventually broken, but among the longest to be kept in history. The dawn of the Egyptian state gave birth to the Egyptian people. It was a culmination, an end to a beginning, like the culmination of creation, which to Egyptians was not the first human, but the first sunrise. Before the first sunrise, indeed before all of creation, or as the Egyptians expressed it, before two things, was the Creator, one. Egyptians thought of creation as the fissioning into many from one. The Creator was unknowable. His creations were innumerable.
blindness was one creation, morning another. Even the gods and goddesses were his creations, among them Geb the earth and Newt the sky. Geb fertilized Newt with seeds which would become the next generation of divine beings. Earth and sky were then separated by their father, Shu, god of air. But from the union of earth and sky there had issued the brother gods, Osiris and Seth, and their sister consorts, Isis and Nephthys. Seth was god of destruction and disruption. In this precursor to the Bible's Cain and Abel story, Seth murdered his brother Osiris cut up the body and scattered the pieces throughout Egypt. But the loving sister and wife of Osiris, Isis, searched for the pieces of her husband and recovered each piece. Then she reassembled them, piece by piece, restoring Osiris to life and wholeness. She bore him a son, Horus. Having risen from death, Osiris descended to rule the underworld, from which he generates the seeds that feed people and birds and all the other children of creation. He sits in the Hall of Judgment, offering the hope of resurrection to humans as he himself had been resurrected. Isis hid from the destructive intentions of Seth with the infant Horus in the swamps of the Delta until he had grown able to protect himself. Egyptians consider Isis to be the protector of children, the ideal woman, and the mother of God, and her priests were the last to succumb to the imposition of Christian worship in the 4th century AD, and the closing of her temple. Horus, Osiris, and Isis were the holy family of ancient Egypt, the son the father and the mother of God. With his father now lord of the underworld, Horus as falcon, lord of the skies, rules that which is above. The king of Egypt is Horus on earth. For three thousand years, the duality of their nature was proclaimed by one after another of Egypt's leaders. Horus sought out his murderous uncle Seth, a god who took many forms. But Horus was not deceived. He harpooned Seth, who had disguised himself as a hippopotamus. But Seth has many other forms. So Pharaoh, the earthly form of Horus, must constantly check the forces of disruption. But he can call upon other gods to intervene. One is the ram-headed god, Knum. Knum brings the annual flood. He provides the silt that fertilizes the soils and makes the crops grow. From this silt, he took the clay out of which he fashioned the first humans on a potter's wheel. His main place of worship stands beside the first point in Egypt to be reached by the annual inundation. An ear placed against a cleft in a rock nearby can hear the rush of the approaching waters before they are visible. On the temple's riverside landing key are marks cut to measure the height of each year's flood, so that tax revenues can be adjusted to estimated crop yields, and emergency measures can be readied. The god Horus who rules Egypt can also request the aid of Toth, Toth is god of wisdom. Toth is honored by scribes. He taught humans how to write, how to measure things. 
In his other form as Ibis God with the Ibis's beak, which is shaped like the crescent moon, Toth showed humans how to calculate time and fractions by observing the moon through its phases. In his baboon form, or as beak-faced Ibis God, he is present at the Last Judgment, standing to the right of the scales of truth to record their verdict. The deceased will be led into the Hall of Judgment by the jackal-headed god of embalming, Anubis. If the deceased's heart on the scale's left pan is heavier with sin than the feather of truth, the devourer crouching below will consume its owner into oblivion. But for those free of sin, falcon-headed Horus, sun god, and lord of the above, will beckon them to eternal life with Osiris in the world beyond. The goddess Hathor licks a person's arm to give reassurance for the last judgment. She is the Milky Way, the waterway to heaven, the Nile of the sky, on which the sun god and the Horus king sail. Hathor is the cow who sheds a tear as she loses the milk intended for her calf, tethered to her leg. She is the cow from whom the prince of Egypt suckles. She knows the pain of childbirth and the joy of love. Lady of the Sycamore Tree, sister to the Horus King in whose presence she is a woman with a woman's ears, not cow's ears, but with her cow's horns enclosing the sun. She is sister to every king of Egypt, member of the family of the sun. Many were her worshippers. Many remembered her, remembered her cow's ears. Today, her temple is a ruin. No one invokes her help. Little is known of Egyptian religion during the 3,000 years that its gods were worshipped, except that their religion changed. What is not known is why it changed. One of the great changes occurred 110 years after the unification, when human sacrifice ceased in Egypt. The death of the first eight of Egypt's unification leaders, one a woman, was accompanied by the deaths of other people, numbering between 26 and 338 including officials, servants, craftsmen, many under the age of 25, in one instance a child less than five years old with little ivory bracelets and tiny beads. All were entombed at the same time the leader was and next to his burial place. Also entombed with them were several young lions. How the humans met death is unknown. It is suspected that their deaths were involuntary, but this is not certain. Human self-sacrifice for a belief exists today, so it is not unimaginable that men and women might willingly endure extreme momentary pain to achieve renewal of life in the afterworld of eternity. But it is impossible to imagine that the child went willingly. Like the young lions, perhaps none chose death. Either way, one can imagine the effect of such a spectacle on buttressing the power of the new leader. The new leader could be seen as a godson whose deceased father the faithful had accompanied gladly into eternity. 
or as dramatic evidence of the new God leader's power to kill. These kinds of death ceased with the ninth leader of the two lands. This suggests that such demonstrations of power or faith were no longer necessary to hold the former enemy countries together. Even so, human sacrifice or self-sacrifice as part of a funeral ceremony ceased not everywhere, but it did in ancient Egypt. But this has not been celebrated as one of the great shifts of religious thought in history, perhaps because the circumstances behind it and the people who brought it about are completely unknown. The absence of religious intolerance in Egypt, one of the first two civilizations, seems strange in view of the record of technologically more advanced later civilizations. People were not beheaded, burned to death, hanged, crucified, gassed because of their beliefs. There were no religious wars. Egyptians did not find the worship of multiple gods to be threatening. Indeed, temples for the worship even of foreign gods and goddesses were built in Egypt and attracted Egyptian supplicants, like this man suffering from polio who is visiting the temple of the Phoenician goddess Astarte. Nor was sexuality considered shameful. Sexuality was considered important to depict in religious art. Here, the god king Sesostris I is shown with his fellow divinity, Min, god of fertility. Sexuality was seen as one of the blessings of life, a force that provides for offspring and for all the food. Min was an expression of the beauty of creation. Beauty was also in the next world. The man who had this painted on his tomb looked forward to drinking sacred waters under the shade of an Egyptian palm upon his resurrection in the Blessed West, the realm of Osiris. Many were simply buried in the sand together with what few comforts their families might provide at this time and on visits to their graves in days and years to come with additional food and drink to be conveyed to them by their spirits. The few in Egypt who had lived in plenty were entombed with plenty. This pottery was recovered from a single tomb. Here, a leg of meat and other provisions were depicted by an artist on a tomb wall while the owner of the tomb was still alive. Why did he want to have this detail placed on his tomb wall? Why were the inside walls of this coffin room inscribed with prayers? After the tomb was sealed, no one could enter to say prayers. And why these tomb paintings of mourners commissioned while the person mourned was still alive? Did these women and girls represent actual persons known to the tomb owner, in this case members of the household of a prime minister of Egypt? Daughters of another high official attired for a funeral banquet. One daughter is offering a necklet to her yet-to-be-deceased father. A funeral procession of men on the wall of a tomb yet to be occupied. But vibrant Egypt is also on these walls. Water is drawn from a garden pool. Grapes are harvested. A banquet is in full swing. The guests seated before tables piled high with food are offered bowls of wine by servants. In the bottom register, both the servant and the guests have aromatic ointment cones on their heads, which will perfume their hair as they melt. On the right, a male servant is attending to someone. Damage has obscured the face of possibly the tomb owner. 
here is a carpenter, brickmakers, a donkey trudging along with its burden, men on a pilgrimage downriver to the temple of Osiris, father of the sun god. Whatever is that pilgrim doing who is reaching down to the water? This scene is on the sarcophagus of Queen Kawit, one of the most successful Egyptian queens, wife of one of Egypt's unifiers. One servant pours milk, announcing it as intended for Kawit's spirit. Another curls her hair. Why did the queen want this scene carved? Another lady at her toilet. The cat of that nobleman hunting in the marshes has caught three birds. Everywhere in tombs of death, the scent of life. This little girl was the daughter of a craftsman who built and decorated his own family tomb. Who were these Nubian servant girls? Were they known personally to the household head who commissioned the scene? And there was the harsher side of life. Someone had this placed in his tomb. Nubian prisoners like those the owner had perhaps seen from military service beyond the borders. Inside the tomb of a general who became pharaoh, bearded bound Asian captives marshaled by their guards. Objects were also placed in the tombs, but why these? A mortal formation of Nubian bowmen, some shorter than others. A unit of Egyptian infantry ordered for his tomb by the future occupant. Why? An estate inspection. Lord and son, scribes and retainers. One retainer is raising a club against the back of a man leaning forward towards the pavilion. Was this scene a fond memory? Was it representative of what the owner expected of existence in the hereafter? The life to come included work to be done, and there were so-called answerers fashioned to do it, little figurines placed in the tomb to perform the tasks called for in the hereafter. A figurine or coffin would have this spell inscribed, O thou answerer, if the deceased is counted off to do any work, whether this work is to make arable the fields, to irrigate the lands, to transport by boat the sand of the east to the west, you, the answerer, shall say, Here I am, I shall do it. And then there were domestic tasks, meats to be delivered. Breads. For quiet hours in the afterlife, the service of a concubine. Some officials and national leaders had 365 answerers placed in their tombs, one for each day of the year, together with 36 overseer answerers, each with a stick to control a group of 10 answerer workers and servants. The departed could enjoy the pleasures of the hereafter without interruption. The royal tombs themselves were like no others ever built. Each was the major enterprise of the nation. During the flood season when water covered the fields, labor on building the royal tomb meant not only extra food for members of a farm family when nothing else was coming in, but also self-esteem from participating in the central national project, the Tomb of the Living Sun God, the Peacemaker of Egypt. This is a representation cutaway of the east side of the shaft and tomb of Queen Nefertari, the actual walls covered with beautiful paintings. The queen playing chess. 
This is the shaft entrance. No towering pyramid over her tomb. When the shaft was dug, pyramids were ancient history. All had been broken into and their contents stolen. Even the tomb of the mother of the builder of the greatest pyramid, Khufu, had been robbed during Khufu's own lifetime. And his own granite sarcophagus within the great pyramid was smashed and left empty. And so with every other pyramid. Many safeguards were attempted. Tombs were hollowed out of solid rock underground and planned with no visible surface feature. This didn't protect them because their location and contents were known. Queen Nefertari's beautifully painted rock-cut tomb was emptied of everything valuable, even her coffin. The records of an official investigation have survived, which implicated robberies not only stonemasons and other workmen, but police and administrative officials as well. One of the few tombs not to have been completely plundered was Tutankhamun's, whose shaft, after two break-ins had occurred, was then obscured by the rubble from a tomb being excavated nearby. Tutankhamun was a teenager when he died after a very short reign. His tomb was small. Its contents were packed into four small chambers. These contents represented a tiny fraction of the entombed wealth of Egypt that disappeared. One small chamber contained a statue on a carrying shrine of Anubis, the jackal-figured mortuary god who accompanied the deceased to the Last Judgment. Behind Anubis was a gilded shrine containing jars holding Tutankhamun's internal organs. This is the lid of one of these jars. Among the many items in the tomb were dismantled chariots, model boats, beds carved in the shape of cows, and these wooden containers painted white, holding joints of meat for the pharaoh's nourishment in the hereafter. There were 413 answerers, like this one, to assist him with tasks in the afterlife. One of his ointment jars. It would have been miraculous had all of Egypt's tombs remained undisturbed. A detail from the back of his golden throne depicting him with his queen. His sandal box depicting exploits in war against bearded Asiatics and Nubians. A gold dagger and gold sheath. A necklace and pectoral. Unlike the remains of other pharaohs whose corpses vanished or had limbs torn apart to obtain jewelry embedded in their wrappings, Tutankhamun's sarcophagus was intact. It contained three coffins, each in the form of a mummy, one made of solid gold weighing 243 pounds. Yet even this, the second of his three coffins, had itself been taken from the grave goods of another person, believed to have been his deceased elder brother. So it was not only the lonely who lived in cramped quarters like these who despoiled the tombs of the great, but the great themselves. It was the great who took blocks from the causeways leading from the mortuary chapels in the valley to the tombs on the desert rim. It was the great who dismantled chapels and used the materials on their own building projects. Endowments, meaning farmland and farm families dedicated to providing in perpetuity grains, meat, oil, fruit, linen, and other items for the deceased and for the chapel priests and tomb guards, were diverted to support the building and stocking and staffing of new tombs and temples, leaving priests and guards of the older tombs without food and desperate. 
Yet despite this history, the great continue to make the task of building and furnishing their final resting place the guiding project of their lives. Egypt had been created by force. To maintain peace between the two lands and within their populations, those triumphant and the aggrieved, was the central preoccupation of the leader, inseparable from his personal security. Powerful supporters had constantly to be encouraged and not antagonized, even when this meant sometimes overlooking serious transgressions, like participation in the robbery of tombs. Never had the conflicting interests of so many people required balancing. Never before had such a multiplicity of problems confronted one individual. This letter from a pharaoh to his son illustrates just one peril involved. Harden thyself against all subordinates. The people give heed to him who terrorizes them. I gave to the beggar, I nourished the orphan, I admitted the insignificant as well as him who was of great account. But he who ate my food made insurrection. He to whom I gave my hand aroused fear therein. And always to be reckoned with was the unpredictable river. The tempestuous desert, which overnight could blanket fields with wind-blown sand. However well the ruler managed to balance his contending subjects, epidemics could arrive, and locusts. News rarely reached him fast enough. By river from the southern frontier, a boat would require three weeks to arrive at the capital. By foot or donkey at 17 miles a day, the journey would last longer. Even longer on the desert route between oases. For the first time in human affairs, time had become important. Even the report of the expected flood height from the Naomida reading at the frontier, absolutely critical information for the country, would take weeks to reach him. Employing carrier pigeons would have speeded communication, but the first mention of their use in Egypt does not occur until 18 centuries after the unification. Then they were being used by the Egyptians for military communication. In the meantime, much could go wrong that was beyond the leader's control, but was still his responsibility. Administrative tools were developed that helped with the task of maintaining peace. Writing was one such tool. It strengthened accountability. It stabilized agreements and contracts people made with each other, reducing the chance of contention and conflict. Writing would even help to maintain peace between societies, as this international treaty recorded on a temple wall. Another administrative tool was the calendar for measuring time, and the surveyor's line for measuring space. But Egypt's chief discovery for the preservation of peace was the conversion of the unification leader and his successors into gods. Egypt's kings possessed no great preponderance of force, which all later governments have had. For a thousand years after the unification, they had no chariots. They could count on no better equipped forces than those potential opponents could raise, men with spears, clubs and bows with flint or bone-tipped arrows. An aura of divinity did not eliminate opposition. 
nor always deter coup and rebellion, but it helped. As Egypt was ruled by a god, there was no separation between church and state. Theologians and priests, servants of the god, helped to promote stability. For 30 centuries, Egypt's rulers built temples, and they provided for the priests who served in them. Together, ruler and priest helped to maintain peace within Egypt. Eight centuries is a long time for a country to experience economic prosperity, seldom interrupted, peace within its borders, and no serious foreign threat. But this period, the Old Kingdom historians call it, ended. Eventually problems were encountered that were insurmountable. Geologists have found evidence of successive years of inadequate flooding. Adding to the misery this caused, the desert wind left a half-kilometer-wide sheet of thick sand piled over once-cultivated fields along the valley's edge. A great famine ensued. But famines, including a seven-year famine as described on this boulder, had occurred before, without breaking up the country. This time, however, central governmental authority collapsed and the population was divided by warring local strongmen, each with their followers. Egyptian writers of a later period describe the result. I show thee a land in lamentation and distress. That which never happened before has happened. Men shall fashion arrows of copper that they may beg for bread with blood. Thus came the first failure of the idea of a god-king. But the dream of the two lands under the command of one god remained an effective ideal and contributed to the country's eventual reunification by the leader of a then small provincial town in the southern part of the river valley, Thebes. This is the head of one of 60 unmummified Theban soldiers entombed in Thebes during the wars of reunification. Internal peace once more prevailed during most of the three centuries which followed. But beyond Egypt's southern border, located at the first cataract, that is the first set of rapids on the Nile, was Nubia. Here, peace did not prevail. Nubia was a land of black people, not of red people as Egyptians saw themselves. At the time of the first unification, deserts separated Egyptians from Libyans to the west, represented by the figure on the left, and from West Asians, represented by the second figure from the right. But desert did not separate Egypt from Nubia. The river led right there. Elephants had not all been hunted to extinction in Nubia as they had been in more populous Egypt, so there ivory was available. Also, there were hardwoods, especially ebony, and minerals, mica, graphite, copper oxide. There was stone suitable for buildings and monuments, as in this Nubian granite quarry, where a large obelisk being worked free of the surrounding rock had to be left in place after developing a crack. Into Nubia came African traders bringing products from deeper in Africa. There were animal hides, incense, precious stones, giraffe tails for fly whisks, ostrich feathers for fans, Exotic animals could be obtained in Nubia. There was the oryx. Egyptians tried to domesticate it. 
They even try to domesticate hyenas. One is being fed by the man at the left. And in place of the essential fifth man helping the other four operators to stretch the poles of a wine press to squeeze grapes, apparently they were able to employ a baboon. But what interested Egyptians more than exotic animals were the gold ores near the Nile and in Nubia's hills. Nubia became one of the richest gold-producing areas of the ancient world. A scene cut into the rock on a Nubian mountaintop depicts several corpses floating below a boat containing a rope-bound figure, a local chief, and the sign for Jer, the second king of Egypt, holding the symbol for Nubia. Egyptian descriptions of relations sound a recurring theme. I slaughtered the Nubians, I uprooted the harvest, cut the trees, torched their houses. Thousands of Nubian prisoners were taken, many to work the gold mines under Egyptian overseers. Children were enslaved, wells poisoned. I have seized their women, I herded all their beasts together, pulled up their corn, and set fire to it. A thousand years after the first Egyptian penetrations, Lower Nubia, the 150-mile stretch between the first and second cataracts, was annexed, becoming a province of Egypt. A precedent was set for later civilizations, in how to deal with other people whose lands contain valuable resources. Along the new southern frontier, 14 fortresses were constructed, six overlooking the swirling waters and rocks of the second cataract to afford protection and assistance to boats in difficulty. This is an archaeologist's plan of the west gate of one of these fortresses. Several were situated within signaling distance of each other. Their massive walls, turrets, and names, repulse of the Inu, repressing the Meju, express their function. The gold and mineral wealth of Nubia contributed to the prosperity and civil order Egyptians enjoyed during the Middle Kingdom, as scholars call the three centuries following the reunification. Egyptians could not have foreseen the kind of future that awaited them, a future in which civil order would collapse and in which they themselves would experience foreign invasion and be forced to submit to the authority of people who did not look like them, who dressed differently, spoke a different tongue, and worshipped different gods. The reasons why Egypt fragmented abruptly for the second time are not understood. During a 77-year period, there were 55 kings, each exercising authority over only a portion of the country. The civil fabric tore. In the words of an Egyptian, the ways are not guarded. Men sit in the bushes until the unsuspecting traveler comes to take away his burden and steal what is upon him. He is presented with blows of a stick and slain wrongfully. The same writer goes on, Behold, noble ladies are now gleaners, and nobles are now in the workhouse. But he who never slept on a plank is now the owner of a bed. All maidservants make free with their tongues. When their mistresses speak, it is burdensome to the servants. Into this turmoil, a force of West Asians, the Hyksos, crossed the Sinai Desert. They came with chariots, wore body armor, and shot a more powerful bow than the Egyptian bow. Lightly armed Egyptian infantry were no match. The invaders built a fortified camp in the delta, from which to exercise their domination. The camp was rectangular, 
each side consisting of wide embankments of earth 45 to 60 feet high and more than a fifth of a mile long. After the occupation had ended a century later, the Egyptians demolished the site. Surviving Egyptian records are largely silent on what transpired during the Hyksos occupation. But during this time, Egyptians learned from their masters. They familiarized themselves with a horse. In parts of the valley, out of sight of the foreigners, they began to build chariots themselves. After a century of enduring the Hyksos presence, they were able to drive the foreigners out. It was not an easy expulsion. This is what remains of the head of one of the Egyptian kings who took part. His forehead bears a cut made, according to investigators, by an axe of non-Egyptian type. His cheekbone is shattered, and the back of his neck carries the mark of a dagger thrust at an angle indicating that the king was already prone when the dagger was plunged. Not an easy expulsion. This man's sons completed the liberation of the country. The fact that the Hyksos occupation stimulated resistance which ultimately destroyed the occupation did not dissuade Egyptians from becoming occupiers in turn. They now possessed up-to-date weaponry and a larger population pool to draw upon militarily than any of their neighbors. To preempt against future aggressions from Asia, Egyptians invaded areas from which the Hyksos had come, and celebrated victories won as far away as the present border of Iraq. They also returned to Nubia and Kush, lost during the Hyksos period, extending military operations there now 300 miles beyond even the second cataract frontier, and set up a new boundary marker. Their campaigns of repression were so thorough that fortresses were no longer required to control the terrorized survivors of these campaigns. People had watched from the riverbanks as the body of their defeated leader was brought back to Egypt, dangling by his heels from the prow of the pharaoh's boat. Slaughtered Kushites were replaced by Egyptian colonists, priests and administrators, a process paralleled thousands of years later by Western expansion throughout the Americas. Kush had been pacified. Its gold and raw materials flowed northward once more. Now, instead of fortresses, temples were built in Nubia and Kush, including the massive rock-cut temples of Abu Simbel, sufficient to awe the remaining indigenous inhabitants with the power of their new masters. Here, their masters' gods were worshipped, of whom one was the Egyptian head of state. Egypt's leaders exalted in their power over Nubians and Asians. Victorious generals were rewarded with collars of gold. Distinguished officers were decorated with the golden flies, the medal of bravery. Prisoners and hostages by the thousands were taken, both the able-bodied and the elderly. Some prisoners were detailed to transport and muscle into place huge column elements to enlarge the Temple of Amun, chief god of their masters. Others to build new temples with walls depicting massacred enemies and numbers of amputated hands and phalluses. Yet others to build their masters' tombs under the overseer's stick. Egypt was now a superpower. Riches flowed to its elites.
With empire came a stream of tribute bearers. Egyptians were confident that the age they were living in would continue indefinitely. They did not suspect that one day it would come to a complete end. The humiliation of the Hyksos occupation was almost forgotten. Years later, one pharaoh, a woman, Hatshepsut, who built this temple against the desert rock and beautified it, made a brief reference to Egypt's subjugation by the Hyksos foreigners. I have restored that which had been ruined. I have raised up again that which had formerly gone to pieces since the Asiatics were in the midst of their capital in the Delta, and vagabonds were in their midst, overthrowing what had been made, for they ruled without God. I have made distant those whom the gods abominate, and earth has carried off their footprints. But she made no mention of the yoke Egypt subsequently had placed on others. Still, during most of the twenty years of her reign, the country was not at war. She erected no victory monuments. She was more interested in engaging in peaceful commerce with distant lands. Painted blocks on her temple depict a trading expedition to Punt, a land whose location has not been identified. Natives of Punt pushing a donkey, above which the inscription reads, The ass that carries his wife referring to the Queen of Punt, who is shown here following her husband. Hatshepsut's still standing obelisk is the tallest remaining in Egypt. A translation of one of her inscriptions reads, I was sitting in the palace, and I remembered the one who created me. But she was not well remembered by her successors. Her warlike stepson Tutmosis III succeeded her. He ordered her title, her name, and her image to be effaced from the tip of a second fallen obelisk of hers. Only the name and image of her god, Amun, was left. Her name was also omitted from the list of Egyptian kings which a later king had inscribed on his temple wall. It has been speculated that the reason was that she as a woman had officially declared herself pharaoh when this title rightfully belonged to a male, her stepson, for whom she was entitled to serve only as regent. There is no record of how she died. The name of another pharaoh was also omitted deliberately from the same king list. Even from the very little that we know, this person's 16-year rule was one of the most remarkable in the country's history. He succeeded his father as pharaoh only because the crown prince, his elder brother, had died first. In of itself, his brother's death perhaps is neither here nor there but it underscores how distant we are from understanding ancient Egypt. Death in one's thirties was the average time that prosperous Egyptians, including the reigning sun god, had to live. Death in one's twenties was the rule for the less prosperous. The evidence comes both from inscriptions and from X-ray studies of hundreds of dead, those who had been mummified by mortuary priests and others mummified naturally in the completely dry hot sand of their graves. People then died young by our standards. The mind of ancient Egypt was a young mind, the mind of physically able people who expected after reaching adulthood only a few years more of life. This also means that most Egyptian children were still young when their parents died. 
This doesn't explain why Akhenaten, as this man named himself, tried to change the religion of Egypt. He ceased to worship its gods and closed their temples. He closed the temple of the great god of Egypt, Amun, whose statue the Egyptian army had carried into battle. He abandoned Thebes, the capital city of his ancestors, traveled down river to supervise the building of a new personal residence and a new capital city, demolished after his death, containing temples with outdoor altars, open to the light. Here were no statues of gods, no holy of holies hidden from public view as in the dark recesses of the older temples. In his temples, in place of worship of the hidden one, Amun, he worshipped the Aten, the sun disk through which emanates the Creator's light. He changed his birth name, which had also been his father's name, Amenhotep, meaning Amun is content, to Akhenaten, which means servant of light. He encouraged art to reflect what is revealed by light, his young daughters naked in play at a moment in time. His chief sculptor, Bach, reported that the pharaoh had told artists to create what they saw. The sculptor applied this principle to his wife, to Harry, and himself. And it was applied to Akhenaten. Here was no idealization of the leader's body, eternally handsome and muscular, as had been customary. Instead, Akhenaten had himself revealed as light reflected from him, pot belly and all. The Egyptian hieroglyph for light is a circle from which emanate rays. Here the Athens rays in, in hands, extending to the royal family at prayer, Anx, the symbol for life. As no preceding Egyptian leader had done, Akhenaten fell free to present himself and his family informally, playing with their children beneath the rays of the Aten. His wife, Nefertiti, meaning the beautiful one is come, was one of the most powerful women in Egypt's long history. She was depicted on temple walls the same size as the king, smiting a foreign enemy with a mace, worshipping the Aten alone. The Aten faith produced what surely must be one of the most beautiful religious hymns ever composed. Here are some excerpts taken from several translations. The hymn describes the setting of the sun disk and the onset of night, night that is cold or freezing in desert regions, the time in which, as Akhenaten and Nefertiti knew, the dead had been robbed of their possessions for many centuries past. It goes like this. When thou settest in the western horizon of heaven, the earth is in darkness like the dead. They sleep in their chambers, their heads are wrapped up, their nostrils are stopped, and none seeth the other, while all their things are stolen which are under their heads, and they know it not. Every lion cometh forth from his den, all serpents they sting, darkness reigns, the world is in silence. He that made them resteth in his horizon. When thou ariseth in the eastern horizon of heaven, thou fillest every land with thy beauty. For thou art beautiful, great, glittering, high over the earth. Blessed are the people of Egypt, awake and standing upon their feet, for thou hast raised them up. Their limbs bathed, they take their clothing. Their arms uplifted in adoration to thy dawning. Then in all the world 
they do their work. The hymnist now turns to other children of creation. The birds flutter in the marshes, their wings uplifted in adoration to thee. All the sheep dance upon their feet. All winged things fly. They live when thou hast shone upon them. The bark sail upstream and downstream alike. Every highway is open, because thou hast dawned. The fish in the river leap up before thee. The hymn does not see the sun as a huge ball of flaming gas. It sees the sun as the source of life, as a face of God. Rising in thy form as the living Aten, appearing, shining, withdrawing, or approaching, thou madest millions of forms of thyself alone. including the seasons. Winter to cool men and heat that they may taste thee. All living things are given life. When the chicklet crieth in the eggshell, thou givest him breath therein to preserve him alive, when thou hast perfected him that he may pierce the egg, he cometh forth from the egg to chirp with all his might. How manifold are all thy works, they are hidden from before us, O thou sole God whose powers no other possesseth. It was a very powerful message, but it did not resonate well with laborers sanding walls deep inside the royal tombs and contending with the rock dust filled air, nor with a mother worried about the bloodshot eyes of the child wrapped to her chest, nor with a pregnant household worker remembering neighbors who had died in childbirth. Ordinary Egyptians didn't want to hear that there was only one God and that the gods they looked to for help with their troubles were worthless. The goddess Hathor understood what women faced in childbirth. The goddesses, priests and priestesses were accessible, comforting, ready to intercede with prayer. Could a household worker expect help from the sole god whose temples were in a city far away? And who had only one priest, who was the pharaoh himself, this pharaoh who had declared, O thou sole god, there is none who knows thee save thy son, Akhenaten. Thou hast made him wise in thy plans and thy power. How could a cleaning woman expect even to gain access to the priest of this god, the pharaoh himself? It was troubling to many that Akhenaten was sending out workers to chisel off the name and image of Amun, the great king of the gods, on buildings and monuments, as here even at the tip of an obelisk. In this photo, marks of the erasures remain visible even after restorative repairs had been made. Intolerance towards their beliefs and banning of Amun, Osiris, and other gods was something most Egyptians could not relate to. 
Religious persecution is not something that comes out of a religious experience that accepts many gods, as Egyptian religion always had done, and ordinary people who couldn't have imagined such persecution happening were shocked by it. It was their first encounter with monotheism. What prompted Akhenaten, beginning in the sixth year of his 16-year reign, to embark on what he did? We are left with this question. After he was gone, the temples were restored, not to be closed again for another 16 centuries, at which time Christianity became the state-imposed religion and banned other religions. The intolerance that Akhenaten had practiced bred a like intolerance in the tolerant Egyptians. They charged him in retrospect for causing their gods to abandon Egypt, so that prayers to them had gone unanswered. They dismantled his palaces and temples. They used even his decorated blocks like this as interior construction fill for new temple additions, including the restored temple of Amun in Thebes. The pink granite sarcophagus in which he had been buried was smashed to pieces, which were scattered over the abandoned site of his city. One of the charges made against Akhenaten was that his ill-treatment of the gods had caused the army to suffer reversals abroad. Thirteen years after his death, two Korea army officers of non-royal birth became pharaoh in succession. They and their immediate successors regained lost possessions in Asia. Once again, thousands of prisoners were herded to Egypt to labor on massive building projects, including the Ramesseum, the 14-acre mortuary temple Egypt's longest-lived pharaoh Ramses II had built for his worship throughout eternity, the Temple of Millions of Years, it was named. He also had men cut into Mountain Rock, the largest tomb in the Valley of the Kings, consisting of more than 130 separate chambers for 52 known sons and other family members. Ramses lived unaware that in little more than two lifetimes equal in length to his own, priests under the direction of the high priest of Amun would gather up 63 royal mummies from the tombs of his predecessors and successors and from his own 8,800 square foot tomb, transport them to two tombs in the Valley of the Kings, stack them within one on top of another. Among them are the remains of Akhenaten's father and Ramsay II's own remains, the remains of the great son of Egypt. Each site was then obscured. Some of the gold and other funerary equipment removed from the tombs that had been emptied was reused in future royal burials. But by then, this was of little concern to the people of Egypt. Their confidence was gone in themselves and in the Pharaoh. Pharaoh, one general had said, whose master is he these days? During the reign of Ramses III, a volcanic explosion in Iceland in 1159 BC spewed an estimated 12 cubic kilometers of rock and dust into the atmosphere, causing crop failures in Egypt, five-fold inflation in grain prices, the first recorded labor strikes, and a conspiracy to assassinate the king for which 40 individuals were tried. The God King's aura faded. High priests of Amun became makers of kings, then made themselves kings. Over the centuries, entire districts with all their inhabitants and cattle had been gifted tax-free to the temples. The temples had received their share of war booty and slaves. The private elite had also been generous with their donations. A time came that the temple of Amun and Thebes itself 
owned 8% of all the arable land in the country, 433 orchards, nearly a half a million head of cattle, 65 villages, 83 ships, 46 workshops, some producing chariots for the army. Amun employed a workforce of 81,322. All temples put together owned one-third of Egypt's cultivated land. Preemptive and defensive wars were exhausting the treasury. And the military was failing. No longer did tribute bearers come from Nubia and from Asia. The empire was gone. The Iron Age had dawned. It was a different age than the confident ages that past generations of Egyptians had experienced. People outside Egypt, in Western Asia, along the Upper Nile, in Nubia and Kush, and even in West Africa, were mining iron deposits. But not in Egypt. Iron was more expensive there than elsewhere. Iron was being extracted from meteorites. No significant iron deposits had been discovered there. At the same time, mines producing copper, the main element in bronze, were playing out. Bronze implements were more expensive to produce. Many farmers in Egypt work with wood or flint-bladed hoes, less durable than this European iron hoe. Bronze went principally for weaponry for Egyptian officers and ornaments for the elite. Egypt was stalled in the Bronze Age. Other countries could field armed forces fully equipped with iron blades and points. Egyptians lost confidence in their country's military capability. The old optimism evaporated. The first invasion came from the south. From Nubia, Cush it is called in the Bible. Nubian forces advanced into Egypt, their king, Pia, taking the submission of the kinglets of the different principalities into which Egypt had by then fragmented, an event recorded on his victory stella. The Nubian pharaohs were the first foreigners to rule Egypt in nine centuries. Coming from a former colony of Egypt, they were not alien to Egyptian thought and had adopted Egyptian customs. Here, the fourth Nubian pharaoh of Egypt, Dahaka, wearing a double cobra headdress to signify his role as protector of both Egypt and Kush, offers wine to the Egyptian falcon god for providing a good flood after several bad years. Dahaka restored temples and built additions to them, including a kiosk at the Temple of Amun in Thebes, from which this one column remains. He also attempted to promote Egypt's security by forming alliances with the small Palestinian states and by supporting militarily a rebellion by the Jewish Kingdom of Judah against the new West Asian superpower, Assyria. From its homeland in northern Iraq, the Assyrian army had overrun cities of modern Syria, Lebanon, and Israel-Palestine. Conquered peoples had been deported, including the ten northern tribes of Israel, and resettled amongst strangers to extinguish their identity. Potential rebels were warned by the Assyrian king not to count on help from Egypt, which he mocked as a broken reed that will pierce your hand. Judah was brought into submission, but Egypt's provocation was not forgotten. Employing a camel train, the Assyrian army crossed the Sinai Desert with iron weapons, scale body armor, siege engineers, battering rams, catapults. The Haka, whose wife and son had been captured by the Assyrians, was driven up the Nile and out of Egypt. At Thebes, the Assyrians wrecked Ramses II's temple of millions of years. As for the people of the city, the Hebrew prophet Nahum reports in a chapter of the Bible these events. Her young children were dashed to pieces at the top of every street. 
and they cast lots for her honored men, and all her great men were bound in chains. The prophet predicted a similar fate would befall a serious capital, Nineveh. It did. The ruins of Nineveh lie just outside Mosul, Iraq's third largest city. The ancient walls now overlooked by the sandbag and wire emplacements of yet another war. The destruction of Nineveh by an army from the mountains of Iran afforded Egyptians only a temporary respite from foreign domination and military occupation. Iranian forces occupied Egypt for 166 years, beginning in the 6th century BC. Egyptian civilization was beginning its long, final illness. When Iran became preoccupied elsewhere, a brief period of independent Egyptian rule occurred. But this period was filled with turmoil and rapid changes at the top. It was the last time Egyptians had their own rulers, the last time for more than 2,000 years. The next experience was a second Iranian military occupation. Eventually, the Iranian forces were driven out by Alexander the Great. Egypt now fell under the authority of a Greek general and his successors. Greek became the chief administrative language of Egypt for the next nine centuries. Next came the Romans. There would be no more pharaohs. Instead, there was a Roman governor answering to a distant and unseen emperor across the seas. The Roman authorities, like the Greeks and Iranians before them, were not hostile to Egyptian religious beliefs and practices some of which were similar to their own. But this changed when the Roman government adopted Christianity as the official religion of the empire. Egypt's temples were closed by the state. Work on this temple was never finished. Left piled against the wall are brick and dirt remains from the mounds made to haul construction blocks to the top. The Temple of Hathor, the goddess who assisted women in childbirth, was converted into a church, as were other temples. The 3,000-year-old religion of Egypt was condemned as idolatry. On old temple walls, the images of Egyptian gods were defaced. Here, today, we see a defaced image of the goddess considered by Egyptians to be the mother from which the cosmos emerged. Monotheism was establishing itself. With all administrative communication conducted in a foreign language and script, the skills of Egyptian scribes became obsolete, and the spoken language fell increasingly into disuse. But then in the 7th century AD, Egypt experienced a new invasion. Arab forces crossed the Sinai and occupied Egypt. The Roman political system was abolished, and with it, the advance of Christianity and the Greek language was brought to a halt in Egypt. Authority was now held by men speaking yet another language, communicating in another script, and practicing a different religion. Part of the temple of Luxor was used as foundation for a mosque. Worshippers gathered outside that same temple's walls to prepare for holy pilgrimage, but to another land and another god. Beliefs changed. Women's status changed. Women were never again the country's rulers, as they had been on several occasions in former times. Ancient Egyptians living lives they expected to be short had made merry with alcohol. Consumption of alcohol would be prohibited. After the Arabs came other invading armies to carry away parts of Egypt's ancient heritage, like the sculptures 
whose forms had served to express people's beliefs and ideals. Ever since the Greek conquest, Egypt's pillaged temples have been tourist attractions. Empty pieces of carved stone because the beliefs which once animated the carvings and the walls are not present. Twenty-one of the twenty-seven original obelisks were shipped away. This one, misnamed Cleopatra's Needle, though built at the command of Egypt's successful empire builder Tutmosis III, is in Central Park, New York. Others are in other cities around the world. The Wheel of Fortune had made a turn. Once Egypt was a civilization of people with confidence in the future. Could an ancient Egyptian have imagined that an Egyptian might one day be a man who sold mummies on a street to foreigners? Civilizations end. Languages end. Religions end. No longer is Hathor the celestial goddess invoked, mistress of heaven, goddess of love, cheerfulness, music, beauty, goddess of women, of fertility, childbirth, children, mother of mothers. Celestial Nurse Vengeful Eye of the Sun Goddess of Destruction The Lady of Drunkenness Goddess of the Dead The Lady of the West Kubanga Murundi, Kubanga Kusasi, 